last Sunday, we lit the first candle in the Advent wreath, the prophecy candle, which is the candle of hope. We light it again as we remember that Christ, who was born in Bethlehem, will come again to fulfill all of God's promises to us. The second candle of Advent, the Bethlehem candle, is a candle of love. God's love is perfect love. It's a perfect love. He holds nothing back. God in love gives us everything we need to live a life of hope and peace. The Bible says God has so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God comes in Jesus to show us perfect love. Love is kind and patient, never jealous, boastful, proud, or rude. Love isn't selfish or quick-tempered. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs that others do. Love rejoices in the truth, but not in evil. Love is always supportive, loyal, hopeful, and trusting. Love never ends. We light the candle of love to remind us that Jesus brings us God's love and shows us how to love others. Love is like a light shining in the dark place. As we look at this candle, we celebrate the love we find in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Thank you, God. For the love you give us. We ask that as we wait for all of your promises to come true and for Christ to come again, that you would remain present with us. Help us today and every day to worship you, to hear your word, and to do your will by sharing your love with each other. We ask in the name of the one who was born in Bethlehem. Amen. Oh, come these
if you're not familiar with the word Advent, um, this is Advent because we are, uh, Advent means waiting and expecting. We are looking forward to when Christmas comes, but it is not yet Christmas. Right now we are in that time of waiting and expectation and anticipation. And on each Sunday of Advent, we focus on a different element of Advent. The last, Advent last Sunday we focused on the word hope, and today's Advent word is what candle did we just like? Uh, the, uh, the love candle, thank you. Yeah, I work here. Uh, so uh, each Sunday of Advent, we will focus on a different, a different area leading up in that anticipation. So we're glad to be here together. If you're a guest with us, if you fill out this little card, it's called a care card, just to let us know who you are, what brought you here, we would love to follow up with you and get a chance to meet you and come and see one of the pastors here, and we would love to say hello to you today. Got a couple just quick announcements. First, we are working on our Adopt a Family, and you've got this pink, uh, pink note in your bulletin, and this is this one is super important if you're participating. Um, it's got all of the gifts that need to be bought. So we've got a family here that's got a boy and a female adult. And then we've got some clothes for Children's Mercy Hospital, including clothes and pajamas that they that they need very readily uh, for kids who, who come in and immediately need new clothes and new PJs to put on. And, uh, so we've got three different groups represented here, and those all need to be by the 20th. Is that correct? So see Pastor Candy if you need any more details on that, but we need all that by the 20th so that so our teams can, can deliver those. Um, our Let Us Adore Christmas program is next Sunday, and it's not your traditional program with, you know, uh, with speaking parts and acting and costumes and everything, but what we're doing is we are using the gifts and the, the talents from around our congregation to celebrate and to adore the one who is worthy of our adoration. So next Sunday, we will do that, so there's going to be lots of different musical and artistic elements to it. It's a great time to invite friends and extra family. The kids are going to be singing. Our youth are going to be singing and playing. And uh, we've got a lot of different elements involved. So feel free to invite people next Sunday. Feel free to invite people every Sunday, but next Sunday would be a great time to do that. And we're going to have just some cookies and milk afterwards. By the way, we still need some people to bake some fresh cookies for our guests next week. And we thought that would be an opportunity for us to mingle and just uh, just chat and meet some people, so come see me afterwards if you are willing to bake some cookies, because if you don't come see me, chances are you're going to get a phone call from me anyway. Um, and then Christmas Eve service, we've got our, as Christmas Eve is on a Sunday morning, so we have our regular service that morning at 10 a.m., but then we also have our, our special Christmas Eve service that evening at 6 p.m., so again, a great time to bring family that's in from out of town or invite guests as we as we celebrate in our service that evening. So if our ushers would come this morning, we are going to continue in worship through our giving. We celebrate what God has given to us, and one of the ways that we worship is by giving back. So this is, uh, if you're a guest with us, this is a custom that we have every single Sunday, an opportunity to give back some of which God has given us. So let me pray for us. God, thank you for the way that you are always are always giving and we want to take this opportunity to be cheerful and abundant and hospitable givers as we give back to the work that you will have us do thanks for the opportunity we love you.
that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humble, but there will be a time in the future when the Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with the glory. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel, and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, and like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift a heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. They will be fuel for the fire for a child is born to us. A son is given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Amen. Amen.
to our prayer time this morning. I think I'd like Kyle to play that song and sing that song again. What a friend we have in Jesus. Those two verses kind of go with where a lot of our folks are. And the altars are open. Uh, we have several needs represented this morning. And I think I'd like to ask a couple or several guys that would feel led. John Kissy was taken to the hospital on Friday and just not looking too good. And I think it'd be good this morning if a few of the guys would just come and you just represent Brother John this morning. Faithful man of the gospel and ministry. Prayed for many, many, many souls, I'm sure, during his ministry. And now it's kind of our turn to pray for him. And then if there might be a couple families that might want to represent the Baxters. Many of you know them. I did not have the privilege of knowing them. But they have experienced devastation and have had a fire and have lost everything. And as one who has been there and know what that's like, I couldn't have made it myself without the prayers of friends and family and church that were there for me. And they are in need of our prayers this morning. And I'm sure there's many others that you know of. But this is a time for us to set aside in the service to pray for the needs of those around us, as well as for us to just lift our hearts to God with our own requests and needs. So as Kyle leads us in this song, would you sing this song? And if you have a need, there's still room at the altar, but then there we have the front pews. This is our time to talk to God. Continue to lift up Angie to you and the 
family there, Father, as it, it just seems like the doctors keep finding something else. But we know you are the great physician. And we just ask, Father, that you continue to lay your hand upon Angie and that you continue to touch her body, mind, soul, and spirit. That she would know that shadow of a doubt she is in your hands. And that you are taking care of of her and this situation. We pray for Brother Kissy today and for Sarah Jane and the family as this is a very tough time for them. And as he's there in that hospital and he himself doesn't understand everything that's happening to him and everything that's going on. But there's one saying we can be assured of this morning that he is ready to meet his maker if it's his time and we just pray father that during the midst of all of this that you would give that family a peace as they're there in that room with him would you flood that room with your peace and your love surround brother john and brother Sarah, or sister Sarah, and just be so close to them today that they can feel your presence very real. That when the doctors and the nurses come in, they'll know something's different in this room. Because Jesus is there. We pray for the Baxter family, Father, that in this devastating time, and it doesn't matter when it happens, it's devastating, but especially when it happens at Christmas. And we ask, Father, that would this be a time that they may draw closer to You? That they would understand that You are there with them through this. That they have family and friends and the church has not forgotten them. And that you haven't forgotten them. We pray, Father, for Pastor Barb this morning who isn't feeling well. We just ask for a special touch on her. We pray for the Christmas families we have adopted, Father. And we rejoice this morning for the faithfulness of your people that one family has already been taken care of. But for each one of those and, and for children's mercy and the many families that will be touched there during this season, would you bless each and every one that would give in the spirit of love and giving and would you bless the families that are about to receive. Sometimes it's a remarkable package and a gift that comes in sometimes the most unremarkable way. Just like the one that did in Bethlehem. No one expected Christ to come that way. And yet, the way He came was as important as the coming of Himself. And what's even more unique about this is He came to us as a baby. <coughs> Dependent upon His lungs, His voice, His legs. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He learned to walk and stand, sit, wash his face, dress himself, all the normal stages we each go through. He chose to come as a human being so he would know us, know what it was like for us in the midst of all the hecticness of Christmas 
in all the Christmas to-do list. Oh, Father, may we remember it's not about us. May we remember the Christ of Christmas that gives us a hope that can last a lifetime. May we receive what's already been done. Heal all of our heartaches, Father. May we embrace the God who is always, always near us, always for us, always in us. There is no giant to be we can't defeat. No mountain so high we can't climb it. Nothing is too big for our God. So we pray, Father, for the continuance of this service. We ask for your anointing upon Pastor and his voice as he brings to us the message this morning about a God of comfort. May each of us be able to leave this morning and say, it has been good to be in the house of the Lord. Yes, yes. Bless each and every family represented here today, Father. Now may we open our ears and our minds and our hearts to what you have in store for us the rest of this service and throughout the day. This is your day. We are your people. Thank you for all that you have done and the many blessings you have bestowed upon us. Now may we in turn be a blessing to others. In your name we pray. Children are dismissed at this time. They continue their worship and learning downstairs with uh, Pastor John and Dana. They fill in down there today. So, thank you. And unfortunately for you all, my voice is back. So. <laughs> That's a. Uh, Sure makes me feel better. I can yell at my wife, my mother-in-law. Had to throw that in there since my mother-in-law surprised me and came today. And we've been praying that they would get into church real soon. It finally happened today. That's good. So, This is good to be in God's house today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Somebody reminded me this week as, as we talk about coming to, to God's house and uh, related to me that how fitting it is because we're a family. So we come to God's house to be with family and to celebrate His goodness to us. And that's why we're here. So I invite you this morning, if you turn in your Bibles or whatever you have the Scripture on, your iPad or phone or whatever you use, to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning of verse 1. And we're going to read down through verse 11, I think. But if you'll just leave your Bibles open there or electronic device, whatever you use, or maybe it's your memory, and that's good too. We'll get to that very soon, I promise. But before we do, shall we recite our motto together once again today? All together? Heavenly Father, I give you permission to 
speak to me, to speak through me, to do whatever you want with my life. I trust the leadership of your Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I came across a story recently about a man who worked for the post office. And this man's job was to process all of the mail that had illegible addresses. Hard to read. And one day a letter came to his desk in shaky handwriting to God. He thought he should open it to see what it was about. And so he opened it and he read these words. Dear God, I am a 93-year-old widow living on a very small pension. Yesterday, someone stole my purse. It had $100 in it, which was all the money I had until my next pension check. Next Sunday is Christmas, and I had invited two of my friends over for dinner. Without that money, I have nothing to buy food with. I have no family to turn to, and you are my only hope. Can you please help me? Sincerely, Edna. Well, this man at the post office was very touched by this letter, and he showed the letter to his fellow workers, and each of them dug into their wallets and came up with a few dollars, and by the time he made all the rounds around the, the post office, he had collected $96, which he put into an envelope and sent it to the woman named Edna. The rest of the day, all the workers at the post office felt a warm kind of glow for the kind thing they had all done. They felt really good about themselves. Well, Christmas came and went. A few days later, another letter came from the old lady addressed to God. So all the workers in the post office gathered around, anxious to see what was in the letter. They opened it, and it read like this. Dear God, how can I ever thank you enough for what you did for me? Because of your gift of love, I was able to fix a glorious dinner for my friends. We had a very nice day and I told my friends about your wonderful gift. By the way, there was $4 missing. <laughs> I think those thieves at the post office... <laughs> God, hold up. <laughs> Thanks, Edna. <laughs> well, the folks at the post office tried to help, didn't they? They did. You see, people is what life is all about. Helping people is what life is all about. Which brings us to one of the most beautiful passages in the Scriptures. It's from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to verse 11. And we read these selected verses. We start off with verse 1 to verse 5. It says this, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem, and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for your God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. All people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Amen. Jump down to verse 9. He continues to say, You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, Here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and He rules with a mighty arm. See, His reward is with Him and His recompense accompanies Him. He tends His flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in His arms and carries them close to His heart. He gently leads those that have young. This is the word of the Lord. 
Amen. Some wonderful, wonderful words for this second Sunday in Advent today. Comfort my people. Makes you wonder, what was the occasion of Isaiah's letter of comfort to the Israelites? Why would he send a letter like this? Why, why would God impress that upon him? Well, it was in 587 B.C. in the city of Jerusalem. The temple, the Jewish armies had all been destroyed by the Babylonian army under King Nebuchadnezzar. That name rings a bell, you remember? In fact, 10,000 of Israel's best citizens were marched off to Babylon in what is now modern-day Iraq. Many of those left behind were imprisoned. Tortured. But in the course of time, those who had exiled to Babylon got married, built homes, had children, settled into their new land. Because after all, they might as well accept Babylon as their new home. I mean, the prophet Jeremiah told them that they would be there 70 years. 70 years. Imagine that. So, they did the best they could in their new surroundings. But still, they were, they were far away from home, from the temple, away from everything that gave them their sense of identity. These were years of longing and mourning for what had been, what they used to have. And to make it even worse, actually, the, the prophets made it unmistakably clear to the people that the, this, this destruction of Jerusalem and their exile to Babylon was not due to the Babylonian strength. That wasn't the reason. No, they were instead a well-deserved punishment from God for the wickedness of the Hebrew people. And so it is in that context that Isaiah comes on the scene with this much welcomed message. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for. Wow. Could you imagine being there with all that was going on, all the backdrop, and then to hear Isaiah come with this wonderful message of comfort? Undoubtedly, uh, many of you will be exposed in the next few weeks, if you haven't already, in one form or another, to the music of Messiah. And perhaps you, you know the history of this splendid piece of music. It's back in the summer of 1741, over the course of only 24 days, that George Frederick Handel composed the music for Messiah. The lyrics, however, a combination of Scripture text from the King James Version from both the Old Testament and the New Testament and also gathered from the Book of Common Prayer. They were compiled by Charles Jennings. And I, in fact, over the last couple of weeks I've been listening to it myself just to refresh my mind with that, that music. But here's what's important to us. The first words sung in Messiah are taken directly from this passage of Scripture. And if you can kind of, I, I wish I could have played a clip, but there's just no good way to play a clip of the Messiah. You know, you got to play the whole thing. And that, you know, and I, I know you'd rather listen to that than me, but I didn't want, I didn't want that to upstage me, so I chose not to bring that in today. But the tenor soloist kind of sets the mood, you know, as he starts off singing. Well, I better not try to do it. I can't do it that way. Comfort ye. Comfort ye my people. Save Lord God. There's some music. 
Then he comes back and he says, Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that your warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. That's, as I listened to that, I, I, I kind of pictured that solo as singing those words that it was Isaiah saying that to the people of Israel. That was, that was wonderful good news for the Jewish people who at this point in time were feeling God forsaken, that God had forgotten all about them. Wonderful news to them. But God has not forsaken them at all. And Isaiah says to them, God has forgiven their sins and has reclaimed them as His very own people. Wow. What a message. What a, what a wonderful message news. What good news that was for them and what good news for all of us who seek to be God's people today even. It reminded me of the Argentine evangelist Luis Palau. You're familiar with him I'm sure. But he tells about a woman by the name of Maria Benitez Perez who confronted him one day. Maria had made an appointment to come and see him under false pretenses. She claimed that she wanted to interview for a job. But as soon as she entered his office, Maria made her intent very clear. She was the secretary for the Communist Party in Ecuador. She denounced everything having to do with God or with Jesus Christ, anything religious. Her bitterness towards Christianity just really overwhelmed her. But Luis Palau listened respectfully and replied gently to everything Maria said. And soon as Luis Palau listened with all of that, with much love and concern, Maria began telling him her life story. It was a tale of pain and heartache and suffering and sin. And she ended it all with one question. She looked to Evangelist Luis Palau and she said, Supposing there is a God, she asked, Would He accept a woman like me? Dr. Palau didn't hesitate, but he turned to his Bible and he turned to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10 and verse 17, and he read aloud these words to Maria. Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. <laughs> Maria tried to explain again to, to him all the sins that she had committed. And Dr. Palau countered again with Hebrews 10, 17. Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. In fact, 17 times Miss Maria tried to explain why she was unworthy to receive forgiveness from God. And 17 times, Luis Blau repeated these same words. Their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. And finally, Miss Maria Benitez Perez, the secretary to the Communist Party in Ecuador, bowed her head and gave her life. To Jesus Christ. <laughs> Maria Benitez Perez was comforted by the words from Hebrews, just as the people of Israel were comforted by the words from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 40, verse 2, when he says, Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for. Of course, this joyous message is not only for Maria and for the people of Israel, but it is for all those who have fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. That means it's a joyous message for all of us, including you, me, everyone. It's a joyous message. Pastor Leith Anderson tells a, about a memorable experience from his teenage years. 
He recalls the story. He said it was a Sunday afternoon. And his father had purchased a magnificent new red Chevrolet convertible. It was a pretty nice automobile. And his dad purchased this new car, was really proud of it. <laughs> Leith himself had a, a humble little Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> One day, his dad let Leith drive his new red Chevy convertible to his friend's house. He decided to take the back way down a twisting rock-lined mountain road. The speed limit was 45 mile an hour. And a friend, you know how teenagers are, a friend told Leith that it was impossible to maintain 45 miles an hour on that road and stay in the right lane. Well, Leith scoffed at that. He knew he could do it, especially in his dad's new car. He would be able to go faster than that and stay in his lane. <laughs> he was wrong. <laughs> His friend was right. Going around the curve, he crossed the line just when another car was coming up the mountain and Leith took out the side of that car from headlight to taillight. And just as bad, smashed up the front of his dad's new car so bad that it couldn't be driven. Police came. Leith called home. His father came immediately in the Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> And he told Lee to go on to his friend's house in his Volkswagen and he would deal with the police and the car and all of that. Now, get ready for the punchline. <laughs> Lee Anderson says that his father never mentioned the accident to him again. Never. Well, I've read that. I've, man, I wish he's my dad. <laughs> Somebody said it. <laughs> Years later, Lee found out that his father's insurance rates doubled for the next three years because of that accident. But his dad never asked for the money. He never told him the cost. <clears throat> Lee said he was very grateful. In fact, he says, to this day, he is still grateful to his dad. That event had an enormous impact on Lee Anderson. Now, we've all been there, right? Amen. Haven't we? Uh, maybe we haven't wrecked our dad's new car, but, but all of us have sinned. All of us have needed forgiveness. Right? <clears throat> and maybe there's someone in this room today for whom the greatest comfort I could give you is to utter these three words. You are forgiven. Mm -hmm. These are God's words to you this morning, regardless of your past. When you come in repentance before God and ask Him to forgive you, you will hear these words from the Master. You are forgiven. Wonderful news. But let me add this. God did not forgive Israel because they deserved to be forgiven. He didn't forgive Israel because He thought their offenses were not bad. No. The same with us. God forgave them simply because He loved them. Simply because He loved them. And the same thing could be said about Lee Anderson's dad. He was probably quite attached to his red convertible. There was probably part of him that wanted to give his son a lasting, 
expression of his life. <laughs> yeah? But what would be gained from that? Lee's dad knew that his son felt bad enough as it was. And at that moment, he knew his son's greatest need was to be reassured of his father's love. And when a parent gives love like that, they are reflecting the very nature of God. Nature. And that's why, that's why it is appropriate that we give gifts at Christmas time. They are a material way of expressing our love. It doesn't have to be expensive. It's the gift. <coughs> the act. Do you know who Rachel Naomi Remen is? Does that name ring a bell to anybody? I didn't know if, if it did to anyone, but maybe, perhaps. She's a clinical professor of family and community medicine at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. She's especially known for her work with cancer patients and is an outstanding writer. In her book entitled Kitchen Table Wisdom, Stories That Heal, it's a great book, she tells about an event that changed her life forever. And she writes that in the beginning of December, the year she turned 13, her father declared bankruptcy. It was a devastating thing to happen to their family just before Christmas. The result was that the family that year made homemade Christmas presents for each other instead of exchanging the store-bought gifts. Rachel herself, a 13-year-old girl, knitted colorful muffler for her dad, and, and using some copper wire, she made a bracelet for her mom. And in spite of their financial situation, Rachel says that the morning of Christmas was just as lively as it ever was, the presents, though, they were homemade, were just as festive as, as always. But young Rachel ran her eyes over the gifts and noticed that among them lay a small velvet box. Rachel knew that such a box was not likely to contain something homemade. And she looked at it with suspicion. And while she looked and wondered what could possibly be inside, she heard her father say to her, Rachel, open it. It's your Christmas present. Rachel unwrapped the present and found in the small box a pair of 24 karat gold earrings. To say she was surprised is an understatement. But for some two minutes at least, she ran her eyes from her present to her dad. Come on, he said, P put them on, they're yours. And her dad said. She ran straight into the bathroom, closed the door, put the earrings on her ears. And cautiously, she looked into the mirror and then something sad happened. All Rachel could see was how absurd those ear earrings, those expensive earrings looked on her homely face. With tears rushing down her cheeks. She headed straight to where her dad left her. She ran into him. How could you do this? She shrieked at her father. Why are you making fun of me? Take them back. They look stupid. I'm so ugly. And I'm too ugly to wear them. How could you waste all this money? And she flung the earrings on the floor and burst into tears. All this while, her dad just sat there, said nothing. And as she crumpled into a heap on the floor, he came over to her, cuddled her in his arms, and whispered to her, I know they don't look right now, but I bought them because someday they will suit you perfectly. Rachel Raymond writes that I'm truly grateful to have survived my adolescence. That 
some of its lowest moments, I could get out the box and look at those earrings. My father had spent a hundred dollars he did not have because he believed in the person I was becoming. It was something to hold on to. Precious. So, young Rachel, Naomi Remen, was comforted by those new earrings because they symbolized her father's love for her. And of course, that's the meaning of Christmas, isn't it? God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son so that you and I can experience life everlasting and free. And that's why we exchange gifts with one another. It's, it's more about the giving than the receiving. Not about the gift about the giving. And sometimes the sacrifice it takes for us to give to the ones we love. Well, Christ came to us not because we deserve it, nor because He approves of everything we are and have done. No. He came because of His Father's great love. For us. Wow. So could I encourage you this morning, take a few moments this Christmas to listen again to the opening lines of Handel's Messiah. And listen as the tenor sets the mood. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. And cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. And then continue to listen as he sings the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And then listen as he moves into a brief bridge. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill made low. The crooked straight and the rough places plain. And then you'll hear the entire choir break into that glorious refrain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Yep. Yes. Wow. My friends, what? news to all of those who have ever needed to be forgiven. I believe, friends, it's good news for you and for me today that regardless of the past, regardless of where you find yourself, God still loves you for you. Amen. And He reaches out to help you. I'm so thankful I am so thankful this Advent season for a God who comforts and knows just when I need it the most. Aren't you? Amen. Can I ask you, have you experienced this God of comfort? Have you experienced Him? Shall we bow our heads? This is not a time we're not trying to embarrass anyone at all. I'm not trying to put anyone on the spot. But I just felt checked this morning that perhaps there is someone here this morning who finds yourself in that place of discouragement, of questions. I don't know what the situation might be or what it entails. We don't need to know, but you're just here this morning and you say, yes, Pastor, the Lord's speaking to me. And, and this, the, I need that word of comfort. I need to experience His voice of peace and His words of comfort to me. Would you just slip your hand up and right back down that it says, please pray for me. I see that hand. God bless you. Is that hand? Yes, that hand. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Any others? 
Just slip your hand up, let it run back down. Just please pray for me. Amen. Let's look to the Lord. Father God, we are an expectant people, Lord. And indeed, at Christmas, we are like little children who view the season with sparkling eyes as if they have seen the greatest gift in the world. So Lord, would you let us, like the children, become excited about the baby in the manger, born to show us your will, to share with us your love, and to tell us that your kingdom has come to us and can be shared through us with the entire world? Thank you, Lord, that, that Christ's coming is not just some distant event that took place in an obscure place long ago, but, but it's something that repeats itself again and again. How we rejoice that the living Spirit of the Lord guides us in faith every day, walks with us through every valley, stands with us in all upright living whispers to us like a still small voice and abides in our hearts and minds with the vision and hope of things eternal. Thank you, Lord, that in this sacred season we, we are moved from carelessness to thoughtfulness. We find ourselves moving from selfishness to giving. From being hard and callous to being kind and gentle. From being indifferent to being concerned. So Lord, would you let such a spirit abide with us, not just in this season, but throughout the journey of life. So now, we ask that you make our souls a manger wherein the Lord of life is born again. <clears throat> that we would experience the comfort of the God who cares and loves like no one else. May we hear Him whispering our name. Hear Him saying, Go ahead, open your gift. Because I see who you are becoming. Who you will be, not who you are. Thank you. We pray this in His holy name. Stand be pleased and receive the benediction this morning. My brothers and sisters, thank you. What, what a joy to be able to gather in this place that we call home. Amen. Amen. With family, brothers and sisters, and experience his spirit, experience the worship. Yes. In this closeness. Now may these words. May they go with you. May you hang on to them. May you use them. May they build you up even this week. And now, people of God, go forth today energized to serve faithfully and lovingly in the days of this week. And may we live in the light of God's redemptive love and share that love with those we come in contact. And may we speak the name of Jesus often and lovingly. And may the peace of Christ be with you all. Oh, Thank you. You are dismissed.